In the 1970s, with slide rules and soldering irons, NASA built a spacecraft meant to last five years. It's still flying today, nearly 50 years later. This is the story of how Voyager was made, the people, the plans, the risks, and the engineering that outlived everyone who built it. A rare window opens. In the late 1960s, a group of NASA scientists noticed something incredible. A rare alignment of the outer planets was on the horizon. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune would line up in just the right way. Something that only happens once every 176 years. This alignment wasn't just cosmic beauty. It meant that a single spacecraft could slingshot from one planet to the next using their gravity. That idea became known as the Grand Tour. NASA didn't jump on it right away. Budgets were tight and the technology felt like science fiction. At the time, they were still running missions under the Mariner program. So this idea began quietly under the name Mariner Jupiter Saturn 1977. But people inside NASA were already dreaming big. Lewis Friedman and a team of mission designers did the math and proved this tour was possible with just a small boost from each planet. Suddenly, the impossible didn't seem so far off. Still, NASA was cautious. The idea was bold and expensive. But they approved a scaled-down version, just Jupiter and Saturn for now. If that worked, maybe they'd stretch the mission farther. Around this time, something else changed. The name. Mariner didn't feel right anymore. This mission would be something entirely different. So in 1907, the project got a new name, Voyager. And just like that, a spacecraft was being built for one of the most ambitious journeys ever attempted by humans. As one mission planner put it, we weren't just sending machines, we were sending our senses, our curiosity, our hope. But building a spacecraft that could survive that long and travel that far needed someone who could hold it all together. That's where Bud Shermeyer came in. Engine behind the mission. Bud Shermeyer wasn't a household name, but inside NASA, he was the guy you called when things had to work. He had already cleaned up the failing Ranger Moon program, and in 1972, he was named the first project manager for Voyager. Bud's job was to turn a dream into hardware. He didn't just lead, he built a system, carefully assembling the right teams, setting quality standards, and solving problems before they ever reached the launch pad. His reputation was about discipline, but also knowing when to take risks. One of his smartest moves? bringing in a young physicist named Ed Stone as the lead project scientist. Bud didn't need to be the face of the mission. He wanted results, and Stone was someone who could guide the science with vision and clarity. Under Bud's leadership, Voyager became more than blueprints. It was wiring, thermal panels, propulsion systems, and radiation shielding, built with technology that looks primitive today, but had to last 50 years or more. He even helped shape the idea that there would be two Voyagers, not one, a backup in case the first failed. You build one for flight, he once said, and another for luck. Bud didn't just manage a spacecraft, he managed expectations, people, pressure. And by the time both Voyagers were sitting on their rockets in Florida in 1990, everything was ready. Quietly, Bud stepped back, letting the mission take center stage. And front and center, now that the spacecraft were built and the course was set, was the man steering the entire scientific direction, Ed Stone, the mission's scientific conductor. When Ed Stone stepped into the Voyager mission in 1972, he wasn't just joining a NASA project, he was becoming the voice and vision behind one of humanity's most remarkable explorations. As project scientist, his job was to guide the entire scientific journey, deciding what Voyager would study, when, and how. At the time, Stone was a physicist with a deep knowledge of space radiation and plasma. But what set him apart wasn't just his technical mind. It was his ability to bring together over a dozen scientific teams, each with their own instruments, goals, and egos, and get them working as one. He managed researchers focused on Jupiter's atmosphere, others chasing Saturn's rings, and some scanning for cosmic rays. He kept all of it moving forward. Stone had this calm, grounded presence. During the mission's busiest years, he became the face of Voyager, ex explaining to the public what they were seeing and why it mattered. He gave countless press briefings and interviews, always breaking down complex science into language that felt personal. He once said, 
Each time we fly by a planet, we discover something we didn't expect. That's why you explore. As Voyager made its way past Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond, it wasn't just collecting data, it was rewriting textbooks. Volcanoes on Io, the deep blue atmosphere of Neptune, strange magnetic fields, new moons, they were all coming in through Voyager's eyes. And it was Ed Stone who helped decide where those eyes should look. Even after Voyager had passed the last planet, Stone kept pushing. He argued for an extended mission into interstellar space, convinced that Voyager still had more to offer. And he was right. Years later, Voyager would become the first spacecraft to cross the edge of the solar system. Ed Stone led the mission for nearly 50 years, longer than most people's entire careers. He stayed with it until 2022, and when he passed away in 2024, the spacecraft he helped launch were still flying. To many, Stone wasn't just a scientist. He was a guide showing us that even the farthest corners of our solar system could be reached with patience, precision, and just the right questions. Key Instrument Wizards and Message Creators Behind the gleaming gold of the Voyager spacecraft were some of the sharpest engineering and scientific minds of the time. While Ed Stone guided the science, it was people like Charles Colhaza, Fred Scarf, and Andruyan who shaped what Voyager carried and how it worked. Charles Kohlhase was one of the core architects of the mission's design. He worked on the spacecraft's trajectory planning, ensuring Voyager would hit its planetary targets with pinpoint accuracy. His work was part science, part art, calculating gravity assist that would send the probes hurtling billions of miles with barely a correction. Fred Scarf, meanwhile, was the mind behind the plasma wave instrument, a device that turned invisible waves into sound. Thanks to him, we could actually hear space, a quiet crackle of charged particles moving through the solar wind. Those eerie sounds would later become one of Voyager's most famous features. Then there was the team behind the cosmic ray detectors, the magnetometers, and the cameras. Each instrument finely tuned for deep space. These weren't off-the-shelf tools. Every part had to survive intense radiation, freezing temperatures, and complete isolation all while sending data from billions of miles away. And beyond the science, Voyager carried a message, the golden record. Carl Sagan led the idea, but Andruyan gave it a soul. She helped select sounds of Earth, greetings in 55 languages, whale songs, Beethoven and Blind Willie Johnson. She called it a message in a bottle thrown into the cosmic ocean. It was humanity saying we were here and this is what we cared about. Building all of this took more than equations. It took intuition, risk, and belief. The team wasn't just building a spacecraft, they were building a time capsule, a voice for Earth, and a floating lab that might one day outlive every one of its creators. These weren't people chasing fame. Most of them stayed out of the spotlight, but without their vision and craftsmanship, Voyager would have just been metal and silence. The spacecraft was nearly ready, its route was planned, its instruments were tested, and soon, after years of labor, both voyagers would leave the Earth, starting a journey no machine had ever taken before. Engineering with 1970s Tech In the mid-1970s, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, teams of engineers were working on something that had never been built before a spacecraft that had to survive decades in deep space with no chance of repair, no return, and no shortcuts. Voyager was unlike anything anyone had ever attempted. The final design was about the size of a small car weighing around 800 kilograms. It had a wide antenna dish at the top for communicating with Earth, long boom arms to carry sensitive instruments far from interference, and a golden record bolted to its side. Inside, it housed 11 scientific instruments, all custom built and fitted into a body designed to handle intense radiation, freezing darkness, and the heat of planetary flybys. One of the biggest engineering puzzles was power. Solar panels wouldn't work in the outer solar system. There just wasn't enough sunlight. So NASA turned to RTGs, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. These used the natural decay of plutonium-238 to generate steady power, a kind of slow-burning nuclear battery. It wasn't flashy, but it worked, and it would keep working for decades. Another key feature was redundancy. Voyager had backup systems for almost everything, 
thrusters, computers, transmitters, so that if one part failed, the spacecraft could switch to another. That kind of foresight would end up saving the mission many times over in the years ahead. For communication, Voyager used a powerful radio frequency subsystem designed with help from General Dynamics. Even in 1907, it could send a data stream from billions of kilometers away, all the way to Earth's deep space network. A signal from Voyager takes over 20 hours to reach us, but it's still coming in. And before for anything could fly, everything had to be tested hard. Vibration tests, vacuum chambers, radiation blasts, freeze cycles. NASA engineers simulated the worst case scenarios over and over until they were confident it could hold together in deep space. Looking back, it's hard to believe what they pulled off with 1970s technology. No modern ships, no cloud storage. They used magnetic tape recorders, handwritten codes, and onboard memory smaller than the average USB stick today. But every part of Voyager was built with care, built to last, and built with a vision far beyond its time. Now the spacecrafts were ready, and in late summer of 1977, with years of planning behind them, they were finally headed for the launch pad. Launches and planetary swing buys. Voyager 2 was the first to launch on August 20th, 1910, from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Voyager 1 followed just 16 days later, on September 5th. Both rode out to Titan 30 Centaur rockets, pushing them out of Earth's grip and into the dark beyond. Even though Voyager Easter 2 launched first, Voyager 1 had a faster trajectory and would overtake its twin within a few months. Their first target was Jupiter. By March 1979, Voyager 1 reached the gas giant and began sending back images that no one had ever seen in such detail. Swirling storms, massive lightning, and most shockingly, volcanoes erupting on its moon Io. It was the first active volcano ever spotted outside Earth. Ed Stone called it an extraordinary surprise, and the world was suddenly looking at the solar system with new eyes. Then came Saturn. In 1980 and 1981, the two probes approached the ring planet, flying close to its icy moons and through its majestic rings. Voyager 1 flew by Titan, Saturn's largest moon, revealing a thick atmosphere that sparked decades of future missions. Saturn wasn't just beautiful, it was complex, even mysterious. At this point, Voyager 1's journey into the outer solar system was complete. It had no clear planetary targets beyond Saturn. But Voyager 2 kept going. In 1986, it became the first and only spacecraft to visit Uranus. It found tilted magnetic fields, strange ring systems, and new moons that no telescope on Earth had ever seen. Three years later, Voyager 2 reached Neptune. The images it returned of the deep blue planet and its moon Triton were stunning. Storm systems the size of Earth and nitrogen geysers shooting out from the moon's surface. Triton, in particular, left scientists speechless. Even after the flybys ended, Voyager's impact didn't stop. In 1990, at Carl Sagan's request, Voyager 1 turned around and took one final image of Earth from over 6 billion kilometers away. Our planet appeared as a tiny pale dot caught in a beam of sunlight. That image, the pale blue dot, became one of the most iconic photographs in human history. It reminded us just how small we are and how far we had come. Voyager had done what no mission before it had achieved, flybys of all four giant planets, but its greatest journey was still ahead. Into the unknown. Voyager was only meant to last five years. Its job, visit Jupiter and Saturn. But after those flybys, everything still worked. The instruments, power systems, and flight path were all in top shape. So NASA made a choice, keep going. Voyager 2 went to Uranus and Neptune. Voyager 1 raced outward. With no planets left, the team aimed even farther into interstellar space. That's how the Voyager interstellar mission began. The new target was the heliopause, the invisible boundary where the sun's influence ends. It took years. In 2012, Voyager 1 became the first spacecraft to enter interstellar space. Voyager 2 followed in 2018, and both were still functioning. Out there beyond planets, Voyager began measuring cosmic rays, plasma waves, and magnetic fields from far-off stars. It was exploring a region we'd never touched before. What makes this even more amazing is that it's all being done with 1970s hardware. No repairs, no upgrades, just rock-solid design. Ed Stone said it best. 
They just kept going and going and going. Modern day resilience. It's 2025 and both Voyager spacecraft are still alive, 48 years after launch. Their signals take over 22 hours to reach Earth, but they're still coming. In 2024, Voyager 1 started sending scrambled data. Engineers worked for months and finally found a fix, bypassing corrupted memory remotely. In May 2025, they reactivated backup thrusters unused since 2004. Against all odds, they worked. After Ed Stone passed away in 2024, many thought Voyager might be nearing its final chapter. But the spacecraft kept going, driven by decades-old systems and a design built to last. Voyager isn't surviving by chance. Every wire, every system was built with foresight, knowing no one could ever touch it again. That's why it still works. NASA now estimates that Voyager can send basic health data until about 2036. After that, the power will finally run out. But even then, the spacecraft will keep drifting silently through space. Our quiet messengers, carrying Earth's voice far beyond our reach. They've become more than machines. They're part of human history, still moving forward, even after we stop hearing them. Alien Repair, Myth versus Reality. Over the years, Voyager's resilience has sparked wild rumors. Some people believe aliens must be helping to keep it alive. Stories have floated around online about impossible recoveries or mysterious signals. But the truth is far more human and far more impressive. Every fix, every recovery has come from Earth. In 2025, when Voyager 1's thrusters were revived after 20 years, it wasn't extraterrestrial tech. It was a team of NASA engineers digging through decades-old documentation, figuring out how to wake up a system they hadn't touched since 2004. Yes, it seems unbelievable. A spacecraft built with 1970s tech still operating in interstellar space. But that's not evidence of alien help. It's proof of incredible planning, disciplined engineering, and deep problem solving. As one JPL engineer put it, we didn't expect it to work forever, but we built it like it might. The 22-hour delay between command and response makes real-time control impossible. Every move is calculated, tested, and sent in advance. There's no room for myths, just the hard-earned results of people who never stop learning from their machine. Legacy and Enduring Impact Voyager didn't just explore the solar system, it changed how we see it. Before its launch, we had blurry images and educated guesses. After Voyager, we had volcanoes on Io, geysers on Triton, rings around Uranus, and a view of Earth as a pale blue dot. But its legacy goes beyond discovery. Voyager became a symbol of human curiosity. The golden record, filled with greetings, music, and Earth sounds, wasn't just data. It was a message. We were here and we wanted to be understood. It inspired future missions like Cassini and New Horizons. It set the standard for interplanetary travel and long-duration engineering. And it reminded us that even something built with old tools can push the boundaries of what's possible. Today, Voyager drifts silently between the stars. It may never be found, never be heard again, but it doesn't need to be. Its mission was never just about where it went, but what it meant. Carl Sagan once said, exploration is in our nature. Voyager is living proof and long after its last signal fades, its story will still be traveling with us. Voyager wasn't built with shortcuts. It was built with care, vision, and grit. Its journey has redefined space exploration, and it all started with tools we now call outdated. As it drifts through the stars, it reminds us, great machines don't just work, they endure. That's how Voyager was made.